Good evening, everybody. Glad to have you with us tonight and a chance to do our Wednesday night Bible study. Pull up a chair, get your Bible ready and a notebook and, um, and singing voice. Uh, let's, uh, let's worship the Lord before we break open our Bibles and get into the scriptures tonight. Um, Lord, we pray you just bless this evening. We pray that you'd be honored in the worship that we offer and the time in your word. Lord, give us receptivity. Lord, just to take in your word, to be transformed, to be changed. Lord, we wanna honor you and be uh, glorifying to you, Lord. So we pray your blessing tonight in Jesus' name, amen. You can clap your hands with this. You'll, you'll know how good you are at clapping when you're by yourself in your house, clapping along. Let all the earth break forth and sing his praises. Let all the earth break forth and shout for joy. Let all the earth break forth and sing his praises. Let all the earth break forth and shout for joy. Here we go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shout for joy. Let all the earth break forth and sing his praises. Let all the earth break forth and shout for joy. Let all the earth break forth and sing his praises. Let all the earth break forth and shout for joy. Here we go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 shout for joy, hallelujah, one more time, hallelujah, 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 shout for joy, <laughs> all right, there we go. You know, it's a chance just to enter into the Lord's presence uh, by singing praises. The Bible says that he um, likes to dwell in the place of praise. So if you're offering praise to the Lord in your house right now, or in your car, or sitting out in the backyard, or wherever you are, um, that becomes a, a sanctuary, you know? And um, we just ask the Lord just to come into that place where he dwells, a place where worship ascends, you know? And to know that the Lord is right there with us, what a privilege, what a blessing. Let's sing that. Enter in. Enter in to the dwelling place of the Lord Most High. Enter in for our refuge is in the Lord Most High. Singing praise. Hallelujah. Singing praise. Hallelujah. Enter in, enter in to the dwelling place of the Lord Most High. Enter in for our refuge is in the Lord Most High. Singing praise, hallelujah. Singing praise, hallelujah. I will lift my hand.
comes from the book of Acts where Paul was talking to a bunch of smart philosophers and brainiacs, but um, he was communing a truth that, communicating a truth that um, it's in the Lord we live and move and have all our being. And um, it's all in the Lord. Everything's about the Lord. It's for the Lord. And that's what he was saying in this. It was like this. turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you there's none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes you rise there's no one like you none like you our God is greater our God is stronger God you are higher than any other God you are healer awesome in power our God our God into the darkness you out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you there's none like 
God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome power, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is greater. If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? thankful that we can serve and worship a powerful, awesome God. Lord, we're thankful that we can know that you're the one that heals and you're the one that is able to defeat the enemy, our foe. Lord, as we study Isaiah, I pray that we'd see those attributes, even tonight, that you are the healer. You're the God who's awesome in power, mighty in every way, shape, and form. We're thankful, Lord. So bless this evening, sharpen our minds as we open up our Bibles. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, why don't you grab your Bible and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 38. It's where we left off in our study. And while you're turning there, don't forget Sunday, um, we're going to be having communion. Uh, so get your communion elements for Sunday service, you know, and have them with your family. Don't forget that as we... Uh, do that service live. It's, it's great to have you jump in with us and get into the scriptures and worship, but also the breaking of bread, communion. What an important part of our service there. So um, yeah, we'll be doing that. Also, um, uh, stay tuned. I'm gonna be probably updating people on a, um, uh, here in pretty soon, you know, the, the governor just made another clamp down. <laughs> I was hoping it would go the other way. Um, but now it's, uh, it's kind of seems to be locking down even more in Oregon and, um, you know, and a lot of people are asking, Brett, what are we going to do? You know, are we going to just stay away from church forever? Well, I don't think we'll stay away from church forever. And what I've always been saying is, um, man, I don't know. We'll see. We'll be praying. Uh, and, uh, but I don't see it being forever. Um, but I also know that the Lord is showing us as we've been on our knees here as, as leadership here at Athey Creek, um, it's, it's been humbling, actually, to um, just be humble before the Lord and say, Lord, what would you, what would you have us to do? And, and um, part of me, uh, there's a fight in me that says, this is ridiculous. And um, Governor Brown is um, wacko. Um, and, um, and, and the Lord is wanting, I think, our, our church to be patient and also to embrace what God is doing right now. And so I'm going to be uh, probably doing an announcement, just, just talking about that and um, and what the Lord's showing us as a leadership team. And, um, and so we'll be talking about that, whether it'll be on social media or maybe on a Sunday, I'll give a little update on that. So, but we're holding steady, if you're wondering right now, or for now, we're holding steady, uh, live online services, really encouraging watch parties. Uh, we don't wanna forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That's something that the word tells us not to do. And that's why we're really encouraging you strongly <laughs> to, uh, to get a watch party together in your neighborhood. If it's you and maybe a couple other families, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, that way we can sort of do what the Bible says, but also comply with the, the law of the land for, you know, for now. Um, but um, I, I do think that uh, something we should be praying for as a church, you know, and I do think we need to watch out for the agenda out there to sort of stifle the church. And that, that is something we're not ignorant of. I hope you know that. Um, uh, again, you know, they're stifling sport, sporting events and all kinds of things right now. So it's not just the church. If it were just the church that they were stifling, 
um, then that's when it's gonna be uh, fighting words, I think. Um, but uh, we're still seeing a bunch of other organizations and any mass gatherings, ex- unless you're protesting. That's the only hypocrisy that is blatant right now is the protesters and how that's all okay, it seems. Um, but, um, but just stay tuned. This is, this is good for us to uh, be patient and trust the Lord. And um, we're just trying to seek the Lord and uh, see what he would have us do. I know there's a lot of, you know, uh, bloviating out there. You know, people just, um, uh, I call them windbags on social media that like to say, you guys should be doing this and everybody should be doing that. And, and that's great for them. They can say whatever they want. But I, I think you also need to say, Lord, what would you have us to do? And I think every city is different. Every state is different. I think the repercussions of a church meeting uh, um, in a one state versus another is actually different. I've talked to some of my pa- pastor friends around the country and um, it's all different. And your response could be very different. And um, so we're just, we're just asking the Lord what to do. So be praying for the leadership here and for us as we're going through this strange day and strange time. Um, Isaiah, talk about strange times. They just had a great victory because an angel wiped out 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrian army. That's, that's where we left off last week. And that's pretty crazy times. Now, this is a crazy time in the world's history um, where it may have felt a little strange uh, to them. We're gonna see where the calendar changes in, in the year that this, this chapter takes place. Uh, um, there's going to be um, historical events that last a long, long time after this uh, because of this year. You know, we look at 2020 and we see it being uh, sort of a crazy, crazy year, and it is. And I think it's gonna go down in history, I really do. Um, you know, should the Lord tarry, if the rapture of the church doesn't happen first, which I think it will, but if, if it doesn't, you know, we'll be telling our grandchildren, well, back in 2020, man, we went through all this stuff and <laughs> it'll be uh, quite, a, quite a thing to tell. Um, but, you know, Hezekiah just comes off of a great, great victory. And, and one of the things that you see in the Bible over and over again is that when you come off of a great victory, oh, that's where you gotta be careful. You know, um, there's so many things that can happen to you. The enemy can attack again, uh, you know, unexpectedly. You might think, well, I defeated my foe, and then he's back quickly. Um, Or another thing that can happen is you can sort of be prideful and sort of forget that you're still in a battle. You know, I hate to tell you this, Christians, but we're in a battle till the day we go to heaven. Um, Till till Christ returns, this is a battle. Um, You know, we're, we're wrestling not against flesh and blood and and all that, but against spiritual principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in dark places. And the Bible tells us that we need to be on our guard. And I would suggest that you should perhaps be most on your guard after great victory. Um, You know, uh, I think we celebrate too early sometimes when we see a great victory in our lives personally and and we kind of let our guard down. Well, that's Hezekiah. He ends up in a situation here that's gonna be shocking. And it has to do with his death. Let's take a look. Isaiah chapter 38. um, It says in verse one, in those days, in what days? The days of the victory against the Assyrians. Um, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Here's the prophet Isaiah. Now, this is interesting to me because, um, you know, like I mentioned on Sunday, you know, you send for the prophet, you hope he says, be healed, you know, and suddenly you want an evangelistic uh, healer coming, you know, uh, because you're sick to death. Time for healing. But that's not what Isaiah says. Um, And uh, he says, you're going to die. Now, one of the things I mentioned briefly on Sunday, but I got to reiterate, be careful for that teaching that says God will absolutely heal you every time. Um, And... um, and the idea is, you know, um, there's people that are out there teaching that, you know, if you have enough faith, that God will heal you. Um, and um, let me just say, there's, there's a little bit of confusion on that. So the confusion is this. I would say, yes, God will heal you. If you're a believer uh, in Christ and you're saved by the blood of the Lamb, you will be healed every single time. Uh, when you're sick, when you're dying, whatever, you will be. The only question is when. When? Is it right now, miraculously? I've seen that. I've seen cancer healed immediately where people at Athey Creek have you know, come back and man, they've given you like 
weeks to live, and they go back and say, there's no cancer in you. We've seen that here. And it's, it's such a miraculous thing. And we love that one where the Lord just supernaturally heals a person from their sickness. We've seen that. But then there's the second tier of healing that God uses. And I, I think it's equally important to acknowledge and, and be thankful for. And that is um, through time and medicine and doctors and hospitals and the natural uh, creation that God has put in your body to heal itself. That's still miraculous. Isn't it amazing that God created our bodies to sort of fight, to heal itself? Even this COVID virus thing, you know, hearing all these people talk about antibodies and the body learning to, you know, herd immunity and all this stuff that they talk about, like they invented it. But actually that's God who did all that stuff that made it so our bodies could survive the hostilities of the microbes and all the bacteria and viruses out there that it's amazing the system that God created. Now, again, I kind of chuckle when people say, yeah, we've evolved from prebiotic goo to you. Goo to you. Um, But I just think that that's fantasy to believe that this could have evolved, even if you give it billions of years. You know, this intricate system that our bodies uh, are able to fend off and fight off, you know, um, bacteria and viruses and stuff. now you say, well, Brett, we're not doing very good with the coronavirus. Well, we'll see about that. We'll see how it goes. But, but the truth is, you know, there is a, a miraculous nature, I think, even in creation. So first tier, God can heal supernaturally right this moment. Second tier, he can heal us through process of medicine, doctors, and our body's system that God created. But the third tier is if you were to die uh, of cancer, then guess what? That's the ultimate healing. You're gonna go to heaven if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, and you're gonna be with the Lord and you, you, you're gonna be ultimately healed for all eternity. So yes, the believer gets healed 100% of the time. Here's where I disagree with some of our more uh, charismaniac brothers and sisters. <laughs> now you gotta understand, some would say Athe Creek's a, charisma, a charismatic church or, because we believe in the speaking of tongues and we believe in the, the gifts of the spirit and the manifestations of the spirit in the church and how ne- such a necessity we don't wanna be the chosen frozen. We want the Holy Spirit to move and, and, um, and we believe in all of these things that are in the Bible. But I, 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 there are a group of believers who I, I do love them and I and don't think that just because I'm speaking something against what they teach says that I hate them or anything like that. It's funny how people will say, because you disagree with someone, you hate them. That's our weirdo culture today. Um, it's okay to disagree with each other and talk about things. But one of the things our charismaniac brothers and sisters, they get a little hyper on this thing where you better believe and if you don't believe enough, then it, you know, your faith is lacking and you won't be healed. But there's a group that says you will be healed right now every time if you pray hard enough and God will do that. Um, and I just don't see that in scripture. Uh, we do see the healings happen in the Bible, but there's several accounts and times where the Lord does not heal someone. He chooses not to heal. You know, remember the story there, um, where the guys were walking through the gate beautiful and there was the cripple there begging for alms, alms, alms for the poor, he would say. And you remember when Peter and the guys walked by and um, he, they, he said, alms, alms, you know, money. And uh, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he stood up. And remember the song, he went walking and leaping and praising God and all the people saw it around them. That's the guy that's been there. See, now here's where the narrative is interesting. He's been there all these years at the temple gate beautiful, crying for alms and for healing, uh, but nobody ever helped him. What's interesting to me, if you think about the biblical narrative, did Jesus walk through the gate beautiful? The answer, yes. Jesus walked through that very gate many times before he was crucified in Jerusalem. And the the implication is that guy was sitting there when Jesus walked by, but Jesus chose not to heal him. Uh, It would be later when Peter and the guys, after Jesus died on the cross, rose again and ascended, that the Lord would use Peter and James and John and the guys to do healings. But isn't it interesting that Jesus walked by a guy that wasn't healed and he didn't heal him? There was a timing. And it wasn't the timing for Jesus to heal that guy, but it would be Peter later who would heal. The Lord would heal through Peter's ministry there 
You see, the point is sometimes it's time to heal and sometimes it's not. And, and I gave you examples on Sunday, Paul's thorn in the flesh, which is called an infirmity in the Bible. He says, you know, he'd been praying three times. The Lord says, stop praying, Paul. I'm gonna leave you with this thorn in your flesh. It's gonna be there and you're not gonna be healed of that. Paul didn't say to Timothy with his stomach condition, uh, be healed in the name of Jesus. He didn't do that. He just said, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake. <laughs> it's like medicinal. Does the Bible approve of medicine? We'll talk about that in a second because I think even here in the story of Hezekiah, we see sort of an implication that the answer is yes. And we see it all throughout the Bible. The Lord does use medicine. Um, there are churches that believe you shouldn't use medicine. You should just have faith. And a lot of those churches actually are not real churches, they're cults. There's some cults out there that try to say that medicine and doctors and hospitals are wrong and you're lacking faith and God's the healer or not. That's, that's wrong teaching. The Lord uses doctors and medicine and, um, and we should be thankful for that. Uh, don't be wacko. Uh, follow what the word says. I'll show you an example of the Lord using sort of a medicinal thing even in our story here tonight. So does God heal? Yes. Does he heal every time? Yes. But the question is when? For the believer. So here's Hezekiah. Instead of Isaiah saying, you know, be healed, he says, you're going to die. And, and, and then he says something that I think is interesting that we should take note of when he says, set thine house in order. Um, that's something that you and I should think about. You know, is, is my house in order? There's so many reasons to have your house in order. Uh, but not just for death. You know, death is something that's worth, you know, uh, getting your house in order, but man, having your life prepared to die. Are you prepared to die? And there's a lot of people, you know, that are afraid to even talk about death. Um, we live in a culture that tries to hide the evidence of death, and we get the tummy tuck and the, you know, the lips blown up and the Botox and the, you know, all the stuff that we try to erase aging because, you know, we're a youth culture and we don't like the idea of aging and we get all freaked out because we're getting older. Uh, more than any other culture, I think, we, we try to hide our age and, and uh, death is, is something we don't want to be reminded of. But, you know, death is very real. Um, you know, you can often learn um, what a person is about on their deathbed. I've seen enough in my own ministry where I've stood by enough you know, people dying on their deathbed where I've heard the things that they've said and, and you can tell the people that sort of have the, and we'll just call it because of this, their house in order and then people who didn't. And the people who didn't have their house in order, they're, they're, there's all these regrets and there's this real heartbreak and maybe even despair sometimes. Famous last words of people. Did you know there's like, there's some crazy things said on deathbeds. John Adams, since we just came off the 4th of July not that long ago, John Adams' last words uttered about 5.30 a.m. on July 4th, 1826. His last words were this, Thomas Jefferson survives. Now, I have to understand, they were contemporaries and they were, uh, if you know the political scene, they, you know, there was a little bit of a competition, uh, if you would, between Jefferson and Adams. And it's almost like you're saying, oh, bummer, I'm dying before Thomas Jefferson. It was part of their, their competition and he's losing that. But as it turns out, John Adams didn't realize, but Jefferson died the same day he did, just shortly before he died. So actually Adams survived Jefferson, but they both died on the 4th of July. Isn't that a weird thing? That's kind of a weird thing, I think. Um, but what did, uh, what did Jefferson say on his deathbed? As it turns out, the last thing they could actually understand Jefferson's last discernible words were spoken on the night of July 3rd, 1826. And he, and he said, as it was turning midnight, is it the fourth? <laughs> is it the fourth? And that's the last thing Jefferson said. Those guys lived, you know, uh, during a time where the, you know, July 4th was a big deal, the Declaration of Independence. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and yet this was kind of their whole thing. That was what it sort of summed up their thing. There was a competition between them. They both died on July 4th. Kind of crazy stuff. Chicago murderer, George Apple, uh, after being strapped into the electric chair, announced blithely, he said, well, folks, you'll soon see a baked apple. <laughs> and then they electrocuted him. Uh, that was his last words. You'll see a baked apple. 
You know, you, how do you go down? This, this is one, you know, uh, that I love. And a Christian missionary, Jim McKinnon, died murmuring this. He said, Jesus, 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 hallelujah. And then he died. <laughs> that's, that's going down good right there. Seeing Jesus, knowing Jesus, praising Jesus. Um, that, that's good stuff. And, you know, really the idea of, of uh, having your house in order, knowing that you're going to heaven, uh, that's the way people should be. And I think whether you're young or old, having your house in order is a good thing to do, generally speaking. Do you have regrets right now? If you were to know you were gonna die in 20 minutes, what would you think? Oh, there's so much left I have to do. And the problem is many of us kind of delay and we put off things because we think, oh, death is so far down the, the road. And then life just kind of goes by. And then people have regrets for not doing what they had planned on doing. And some of the goals that they'd set, dreams that they'd had, things the Lord had called them to do. Charles Haddon Spurgeon concerning death said, men have been helped to live by remembering that they must die. So it's not a bad thing to remember that, you know, everybody dies, 10 out of every 10 people die. Uh, it's not a bad thing. It's not a depressing thing, but it should be something that helps you live. Men have been helped to live by knowing that they must die. Thomas A. Kempis, who uh, you know was that sort of monk who wrote that amazing book, Imitation of Christ. And when he talked about this, he said this, thou oughtest so to order thyself in all thy thoughts and actions as if today thou wert about to die. Labor now to live so, that at the hour of death thou mayest rather rejoice than fear. Order yourself in all your thoughts and actions as, as if you were to die, about to die. That's how he said you're supposed to live. Interesting, and I think that's wisdom. And Ephesians, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 5, 16, redeeming the time, that's what we're supposed to be doing, redeeming the times. Why? Because the days are evil. Are the days we're living in evil? <laughs> Boy, I think that's uh, pretty easy to answer. We're living in evil times, dark times. So what should we be doing? Redeeming the time, making the most of the time. And that's really what Isaiah says, Hezekiah, it's time to get your house in order because man, you're about to kick the bucket. <laughs> and, uh, and so what does Hezekiah do? Well, he's not gonna take that advice. Uh, instead, he's gonna chirp like a bird and argue and say, Lord, I wanna live. And we looked at this notion, this idea on Sunday, but let's, let's read on. Let's see what, uh, what Hezekiah does with his remaining years. So it says in verse two, then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Now pause for a second. Good. So far, so good, man. You're going to die. And so he turns and starts praying to the Lord. Great. So far, so good. And verse three, and he said, remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Your margin probably says like the original Hebrew is with great weeping, like ugly cry. That's what, that's what Hezekiah is doing here. He's ugly crying and he's kind of freaking out. He weeps sorely and says, Lord, I have done, I've walked perfect before thee. I've, I've, I've done that which is good in thy sight. Now, this is an interesting thing because it's a hard one to reconcile as I read this because in some ways we could say, boy, it's true. Hezekiah was a godly king and a good guy. And you might just kind of say, yeah, that's true, man. He really did follow the Lord. And this is, no, no, you know, no wonder. But does it, does it seem a little weird that he's weeping so hardly at the same time saying, but Lord, I've served you perfectly. <laughs> There's something about him serving the Lord perfectly and saying, I've been perfect before you and I've done all that which is good in thy sight. But then he's just weeping sort of with a great weeping about his ensuing death. There's something that doesn't jive there, and I'll tell you what it is. And you know, maybe I'm reading into this, but we know, you know, that Hezekiah was a sinner just like all of us. Oh, he was a good king, and I, I got to give him credit, and I have, and we do. Um, but at the same time, he was he was a person, uh, and even the best of the people are still sinners. And 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 it's not that he's really not really acknowledging his sin or his shortcoming, he's saying, Lord, I've lived perfectly before you. What are you doing killing a perfect guy like me? I just wonder if this is the beginning 
of his wrong thinking. Right here. Um, a lot of people will put it later when he sort of insists that he should live. Uh, and we can agree that uh, you don't want to insist on anything before the Lord. We're supposed to pray like Jesus taught us to pray, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. You can ask the Lord of anything, whatever you ask in my name. So when you say, Lord, I, I want to live, but I pray this in your name, which means in your nature, according to your will, according to your plan, that's what I would ask. And then the Lord will do his will concerning that as you submit to his will. Hezekiah is making sort of an argument here. I'm perfect. I'm really good. And thus I, I want to live. You know, you know, and he's weeping bitterly with great weeping. Um, and I think it's wrong for us to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Even if Hezekiah was as good as he says he is here, it's not a healthy worldview to say, I'm a good person and I deserve this, or I deserve that. I deserve to live because I'm perfect and I've been done all that is right in your sight, Lord, so I should be able to live here. That's sort of the, where he's going with this argument. The right mentality is to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and then he will lift you up. Um, we're not to, you know, self-conceit is nothing but self-deceit. When you start telling yourself you're good and you're living perfectly, like Hezekiah's saying here, you're just deceiving yourself because Hezekiah was a sinner. And if you listen to our teaching on Sunday, and we'll talk about the word deprived that he brings up here later, um, that's the whole problem. I've been deprived of my years. How could he think that? It's because he thinks he's done everything good and he's been deprived. And everybody else you know, has got what they want. They get to keep living and they're privileged, but I've been deprived. And we talked about that, about privilege versus people being deprived of equal rights. It's a big issue today. People talking about, you know, white male privilege and, and how others are being, you know, sort of, you know, deprived of certain things. And, and there's this worldview of defending that. But the Bible actually teaches all of us, good, bad, and ugly, rich, poor, lame, athletic, happy, popular, impoverished, wealthy, whoever you are, we, we're not deprived, we're all depraved. That's what we talked about on Sunday. Deprived or depraved, the answer, we're all depraved. We all deserve death and hell. Anything better than that is icing on the cake. <laughs> if, if you've got anything good in your life, um, then guess what, that's just, you're just by the grace of God experiencing that. You didn't deserve that, you didn't earn it. Um, it's just what God has done. And this worldview of saying, I've been deprived, that's never helped anybody. It only makes matters worse, historically speaking. I think that that attitude of, of Hezekiah thinking he deserved something was early in this chapter, maybe even right here in the verse we just read, right here in verse three. Lord, I've been perfect, a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And he weeps with a great weeping, um, interesting now, by the way, this story, this is the third time we're reading this story in the Bible. The first time we saw it is in 2 Kings 20. The second time we saw it is in 2 Chronicles 32 and now here in Isaiah 38. Um, this is a story that God wants us to get because he gives it to us three times and the third time's a charm. Hopefully we're getting some of the, the nuances of this story because God reiterates it three times. That's important. Well, so here he is, you know, weeping. Now, now if we jump ahead, by the way, uh, verse, look at verse 14. Just a little sneak preview. In verse 14, like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove. My eyes fail with looking upward. Oh, Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. The word undertake there um, is probably better translated. Ease my pain, Lord, is what he's saying. This is his attitude. That's how I, I mean, it's not that I'm just reading into what he's saying. I've been perfect. Uh, I've sort of been good all these days and he's weeping sorely. No, there's an indication that he's weeping a little too much, chirping like a bird. He even admits it. And he even says, uh, my eyes fail with looking upwards. I'm, I'm tired of looking up to you, Lord, because I can't even believe you're letting me die. That's kind of what he's saying. So we see a problem in Hezekiah by demanding, I want to live right here. So it goes on, and in verse four, uh, the word comes through Isaiah once again. First Isaiah told him, you're gonna die, get your house in order. Now Isaiah's gonna say, okay, I've, you know, I've seen you've prayed and you've been saying, I wanna live. 
Uh, and so Isaiah answers, verse four. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah saying, go and say to Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. Hmm. He will add unto his days 15 years. You know, um, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, you say, well, the Lord did it, so it must be good. But you remember, you know, sometimes the Lord allows things. Remember we talked about God's perfect will versus what he allows. He'll allow things that are not, I don't think it's his perfect will, but maybe more, you might call it his permissive will. Um, in Psalm 106, um, verse 15, it says this. Um, the Lord gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. Remember that on Sunday? That was the children of Israel who just said, we want meat, remember? And the Lord said, okay, all right, I'm gonna give it to you. And they, did, they had meat coming out their nostrils. Uh, like it got ugly because of their sin. The Lord said, okay. And so this is where Hezekiah, I think, is maybe doing the same thing, sort of demanding something of the Lord. I wanna live, I don't wanna die. And so the Lord says, okay. And, and some might say, well, the Lord is answering his prayer. This must be good. I'm not so sure. Um, we have to be careful about this because sometimes the Lord gives people stuff because they're asking so hard. So he says, I will add unto thy years 15, thy days 15 years. Verse six, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backward. So the sun returned 10 degrees by which degrees it was gone down. Huh, what happened? Well, this is a strange thing in the Bible. This is one of those Bible strange things. That there was a sign that said, Hezekiah, you're gonna get 15 more years. And just so you can know that I'm not just messing around and this is of me that I'm the one allowing you to live 15 more years. See, the, the temptation without a sign from God would be to think, oh, Hezekiah got better, what a coincidence. Um, but this is gonna be an undeniable sign from God saying, I'm giving you 15 more years, and here it is. And the sh shadow of the sun will go backward uh, by 15 degrees. Isn't that something? Now, again, in the Second Chronicles 32 account, this is the parallel account, um, the, the, it says the sun would go backward, not forward. So you say, wow, how does the sun do that? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> did the, did the sundial move and make the, the shadow move? And was there a te tectonic shift that made something change? Uh, or, or did something else happen? Well, we know from the biblical narrative here, we know the exact year that this is. It's 701 BC. And I'm not making a huge case, and I wouldn't die on this battlefield, but you should know about this. There were some crazy things that happened in 701 BC. If you look it up on Wikipedia, one of the things you'll see is um, the changing of the calendars. Uh, and and it's, it's almost like there's no apparent reason, but they shifted the days of the calendar in um, the, uh, you know, uh, what I would call the intellectual world at that time. People that ha kept track of dates and times there was a shift in 701 BC. Um, in all the calendars changed. Uh, you can see the long day of, of Joshua in the signs of the heaven, uh, uh, the uh, Joshua commentary series. But there's some crazy things about, um, about this that, that happened. And, and um, you know, uh, one of the things that somebody suggests, uh, and, and again, I'm not a scientist, nor am I you know, into, uh, I took a class in college it was physics 101, physics 102, outer space and solar system. It was just enough to make me dangerous. But I do love outer space and solar system. But some argue in 701, Mars passed by the Earth very cl uh, close. And there's legend that happened, that came from that. And how close did it pass? Um, uh, it's debatable. But Here's what's interesting, like, like uh, I, I probably going way off the course, but did you know that in Gulliver's Travels, Jonathan Swift, in 1726, this is before the United States, were, you know, we've, before we were in a nation, um, described the two moons of Mars in precise detail. 
Now, 150 years before they were even discovered, the moons of Mars were discovered in 1877. Um, but some believe Jonathan Swift was drawing upon legends, which were really eyewitness accounts, um, implying the near passing by of Mars. And, and you say, well, how near was it? Some would say it was near enough to change a little bit the earth uh, and uh, in, in relation to the, its you know, axis, its orbit, um, and the, the, the traveling you know, in, around the, the sun. Who knows? But uh, some would argue that this is what happened, something like that, some celestial thing that happened that caused the earth to change a little bit and the shadow changed 10 degrees on the sundial. Um, and there's a reason why they changed all their calendars in 701. Who knows why? And there's people that have studied, and you'll find all kinds of conspiracy theory websites and stuff that talk about crazy stuff. Have fun with that. But I just believe the Bible. You know, that's, that's my thing. I, I don't spend my whole life trying to nail down all that stuff. But I do believe that something happened where the sundial of Ahaz, uh, the shadow went backward for 10 degrees, um, which is about 45 minutes, by the way, if you look at the sundial, as it were, back in those days. And that would have been a weird thing. You know, we all saw that solar, you know, eclipse, uh, you know, when was that? Was it two summers ago now? Um, but what a deal, you know? Can you imagine being an ancient person and suddenly it's just going dark in the middle of the day for just a few minutes? And the temp remember how the temperature fell? That was, quite, that was I, I was kind of um, thinking the, the eclipse would be sort of whatever, but it was an amazing thing. Sitting there, we, we drove down south just a little further from here to get a little longer experience of that and just feeling the temperature drop. You know, it was a nice warm, summery morning. And then all of a sudden, it's, it's like chilly. Everybody's like putting on their coats and stuff in the middle of the day. It was just such a, a strange celestial happening. They must have thought back in the ancient times, what's going on, the end of the world, you know? But apparently this is something where the Lord says, I'm gonna show you a sign and here's how it's gonna work out. Um, so just something for you to think about, uh, kind of interesting to say the least. But that's the sign the Lord gave to him. Okay, so I'm gonna live. Now he knows because of the sign. And then Hezekiah writes about the story from his perspective and he starts that in verse nine. It says, verse nine, the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. Then I said, in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. That's what we talked about on Sunday. Was he deprived? Well, that's just an entitled sort of attitude that he had. I'm, I'm entitled to longer years, Lord. And I think that's one of the great problems of today with culture. We feel like we're deprived. We've, we've, we're entitled to this or that. What we're entitled to is death and hell. Anything past that is God's grace for anyone. Well, he says, I am deprived of the residue of years. Verse 11, I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord. In the land of the living, I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. Mine age is departed as is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off like a, weaver's, uh, like a weaver my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness from day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. I reckoned till morning that, that, that as a lion, so will he break all my bones from day even to night will thou make an end of me. Now, now pause for a second. Do you kind of sense that Hezekiah's blaming the Lord for crushing up his bones? He's, he's sort of saying, the Lord did this. Um, the Lord has cut me off like a tent. He will cut me off with pining sickness. That's, he's blaming the Lord. Uh, and making this negative thing on the Lord. Be careful about that. Um, so verse 14, like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove. Mine eyes fail with looking upward. Oh Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it. I shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. Oh Lord, by these things men live. And in all these things is the life of my spirit, so wilt thou recover me and make me to live. This is where he sort of changes. After he says, I chirped like a bird and the Lord was gonna crush my bones and I was gonna be cut off and die. Then he says, but then the Lord says, okay, you can live. And this is what he says, Lord, you, you're the one who's gonna recover me. Verse 17, 
Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Now, one of the things about when we're wrong about stuff, it's amazing how easily we can weave bits and pieces of truth that legitimize the stupid, uh, the stupid things, the stupidity that we are sort of chirping out uh, and, and, and that gives it more authenticity. Um, Hezekiah is saying false things, but he's also saying true things like this, uh, one of the truest things. For thou hast, verse 17, cast my sins behind thy back. That's what the Lord has done. He takes our sins and casts them into the sea, the Bible says, and he remembers our sins no more. Um, I, I love that, that nature of God that is able to forgive and forget all of our trespasses and our sins. So Hezekiah is saying something that's actually true here. I love it, good stuff. But, but a lot of it's not true, you know, where the Lord's, you know, unfairly crushing his life off. That was not true. Verse 18, for the grave cannot praise thee, Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living, as he shall, uh, he shall praise thee. As I do this day, the father to the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. For Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil and he shall recover. Hezekiah also had said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? Um, so the sign was this moving of the sun and he was saying, well, the Lord's gonna save me and now I'm gonna sing songs for the rest of my days because God delivered me, I'm a happy dude. Life is good, 15 more years, great. But, but he also says, um, what Isaiah told him to do, there was, there was sort of a prescription to his boils that, were, that was on his body that was killing him. And it was take figs and make a sort of a paste substance out of the figs and plaster that, that fig stuff over his boils. And that was sort of the way he was healed. Did the Lord need to use fig paste or could he just said, I'm gonna heal Hezekiah, ding, and suddenly he's healed. Because we see other examples out in the Bible where God just healed people instantaneously without fig paste. But it is interesting, there are times where the Lord employs stuff that was thought to have been medicinal, and it maybe even wasn't. But somehow, maybe it was a helper of people's faith to, to see something actually happening. I don't know. Remember the guy that was blind and the Lord made mud and spit and he put mud in the guy's eyes? That was thought to have been medicinal, both spit and mud. And God, Jesus says, I'm gonna do this and then go wash yourself and you'll be healed. Did the Lord need to make mud and spit to make that guy healed? He could have just said, be healed. Why did he do that? I think it was in a way God saying, I can use whatever humans think is helpful. I can use that even. You know, even in our stupidity, we can be helped by medicine. And that, that's important. We see that with Paul talking about Timothy's stomach, drinking a you know, some wine for his stomach. We see it with the mud and the spit. We see it with Hezekiah using these fig, this fig paste covering his boils. Um, you know, so the Lord does use medicine. Don't, don't be those people that say, we don't need medicine because we have faith. Um, I think sometimes the Lord does legitimately use medicine. And sometimes that can even help our faith in trusting the Lord. So here he tells kind of that story. Now, you might say, great, Hezekiah lives, everything's great, and he got what he wanted, good. But here's where we start to see why, perhaps, the Lord said, it's time. It's time for you to come home and be in heaven. But Hezekiah said, no. Had Hezekiah died right here in chapter 38, I think that would have, in the bigger picture of eternity, would have been a better thing for Hezekiah. I know that because we can look retrospectively back through history and say, he should have kicked the bucket. It would have been better for him to die and go to heaven. We wouldn't have known that standing in front of Hezekiah. I mean, what could be worse? Hezekiah, our king, dying? That's horrible. But how do we really know? How do we know what's bad is actually bad? How do we know that it's actually not good? Remember the Chinese proverb where the, 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 the Chinese tell some lengthy, lengthy, tiresome proverb, but it's on purpose. And it's basically this farmer and the neighbor, 
And the neighbor comes out and says, man, did you hear a war broke out? And the farmer, and the, the, the neighbor says, that's horrible, there's a war. And the Chinese farmer thoughtfully said, how do you know that it's bad? And the guy said, oh, he walked away. And, and then um, the, the, the farmer came out, or the, you know, the, the neighbor came out and said, they're doing a draft, and they're gonna draft all the young men of our community, and, and, and your son is gonna be drafted. That's bad. And the farmer said, how do you know? <laughs> well, well, then, sure enough, the farmer's son was drafted. But then the draft took him, trained him, threw him into the very front of the battle. And the, the neighbor said, man, I heard your son was positioned at the front of the battle. That's bad. And he said, how do you know? Well, as it turns out, the son was injured at the front of the battle, a broken leg. And the f- neighbor came over and said to the farmer, your son's leg was broken. That's bad. He said, how do you know? as it turns out, the son was taken back to get medical care. The next day, the son's entire, you know, regiment was wiped out by the enemy. The son was saved because he broke his leg. And the whole regiment was wiped out. And the neighbor said, did you hear the regiment was wiped out? That's bad. And the farmer said, how do you know? And on and on the story goes where everything the neighbor says, that's bad. And the farmer says, how do you know that it's bad? Because we really don't know. We don't know anything. And so here's Hezekiah, I'm gonna die, that's bad. Well, actually, it would have been really good if you saw the big picture. And we know that because of chapter 39. Chapter 39 is one of the events among several that happened in the last 15 years of Hezekiah's life. This is a really embarrassing one. This is one that poor Hezekiah, I bet he was thinking in heaven right now, oh man, I should have just kicked the bucket when the Lord said, now Pastor Brett in Portland, Oregon in 2020 is reading about me being a complete idiot. Uh, I wonder, I wonder if Hezekiah is even right now, I don't think there's regrets in heaven. So I think we'll, but we'll have to ask Hezekiah when we get to heaven to see what he thinks about this. But let's read. It says in chapter 39, verse one, at that time, Merodach Baladin sounds ominous because he actually is fairly ominous. If you look up Merodach Baladin, we don't know much about him other than he's sort of a tyrant and he was, a, he was a guy who sort of has superimposed his power upon the Babylonian empire and, and sort of assumed himself to take the throne of Babylon. Now, Babylon at that time wasn't the world power we know it to be yet. Uh, Merodach Baladan was the guy who started to give it power and give it teeth. Uh, remember the Assyrian army at this time was the world power by far. But one of the things Merodach Baladan did is he pushed back the Assyrians and they, they were, other than the Jews defending Jerusalem and the 185,000 Assyrian soldiers being killed by the angel, other than that, the Assyrians hadn't been um, even like touched for even a second. The Assyrians were dominating everyone except for the Jews in Jerusalem. And shortly thereafter, Merodach Baladan pushed the Assyrians back. And that would be the first country who did it just on their own power. The Jews did it with God's power and an angel slaying 185,000 soldiers. That's great. But Merobach Daladan was this guy who was just kind of building his power as a a up and comer in Babylon. Um, Later he'd be defeated uh, ultimately by the Syrians. Um, But in the meantime, what is he doing here? That's the question. Ask yourself, why does Merodach Baladan do what he does in chapter 39? Well, it says, at that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of uh, Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and was recovered. Man, he gets this hallmark and some balloons from Merodach Baladan. Uh, And this just makes Hezekiah delighted. Oh, a gift for me from old Mero over in, you know, Babylon. Check it out in verse two. Hezekiah was glad of them. And he showed them the house of his precious things. Showed who? The Babylonians. So they give him the gift. Merodach, Daladan, and the, and the Babylonians come and visit, little sick visit or whatever. He was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor uh, in all of his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Oh my goodness. It's like Hezekiah says, okay, 
um, this guy sent me some balloons and a card and some get well stuff. And, and so I'm just, he's my bro, man. Be careful. Because in, in a way, you know, when a guy like Mero Dakbaladan Dac does this kind of stuff, you might have to say, why is he doing it? You should be a little bit skeptical. Um, it was really possibly just none other than flattery. What's flattery? Um, you know, flattery, uh, flatterers look like friends as wolves look like dogs. That's the problem. He's, he's flattering as, oh, I'll get well, we're so glad you're better, and man, that's great. And now he comes as sort of a friend, but he's a poser friend, he's not real. So, th- so he basically, um, now by the way, this is where uh, historically Babylon sort of in- introduced to history right here in Isaiah 38, 39, where Babylon's introduced into the world's history as a power. Um, and this is one of the first things we see the Babylonians actually do. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting thing. The first thing they do is send a get well card and then go visit Hezekiah and observe all of his precious things and all the stuff that he's got, you know. Um, now, uh, you say, well, but there's nothing wrong with that. Now, this is an interesting thing to me because if you think about it, Hezekiah in the last few chapters has received two letters. One letter, do you recall, it was from Sanhariv by Rav Shaka. Do you remember what he did with that letter? He took the letter before the Lord in the temple and he spread it out before the Lord and prayed and said, Lord, what do I do about this letter? In chapter 39, we have him receiving a letter from Mero Dakbaladan and he takes the letter and what does he do? He, he's like, oh, I've got a friend. This is awesome, wonderful. He doesn't pray about the letter. I would say this is a good lesson for you and for me. Just because we think something's bad doesn't mean it's, it's, it's bad. Just because we think something's good. I'm not talking about relativism, but don't assume. He thinks this is a good letter from Merodach Baladan, but it's actually sinister and evil. And it's the good letter that actually ends up nailing him. Remember the bad letter, he prays about it. The Lord help me. And the Lord says, I'm gonna help you from this Assyrian threat. But had Hezekiah done the same thing with letter number two, Lord, I got a nice get well card from this guy. Spread it out for, what what should I think about that? Because, you know, the good flattery letter could be just as dangerous. And as it turns out, it would be very dangerous for Hezekiah. When I was a young pastor in training, my pastor told me some wise words. And he said, Brett, whatever you do, when you're a pastor, don't believe your press clippings. And, and uh, he said, you know, you, as a pastor, you get press clippings. People say stuff about what you're doing. And he said, just don't believe them. And, uh, and, and, and he explained that, you know, sometimes people will say, Brett, that was the worst teaching I've ever heard. And I think you're a heretic and you're a loser and you don't know anything about the Bible. And people will say that stuff. And, and my pastor said, Brett, don't believe that. But bring it to the Lord and say, Lord, what did you think about that teaching? Did I speak your word or did I not? And, and spread it out before the Lord and, and believe what the Lord says about that. But he also said, but be really careful because there, you'll also get press that says, Brett, that was one of the most anointed, blessed teachings you've ever given. And people will pat you on the back. Don't believe that press cl- clipping either because that could just as easily be something that's gonna stumble you up. But the key is, is to think about what you do in light of what the Lord thinks about stuff because that's all that matters. You know, if you're just trying to say stuff to flatter yourself or make people say good things about you or people click like on your, what you've done, man, I wonder if your motives could be so easily off. I, I believe, by the way, the platform of social media is a massive pitfall where people use it to try to be liked, to try to get pe- win people over as, wow, this person's really dialed in. Look what they do, look what they have, look what they said, look how much they know. You know, and, and we try to get clicks of likes, like, 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 like. And, um, and, and, and yet, man, it, it just kind of feeds that prideful arrogance that is kind of seated in our heart. Um, but what you have to ask is, did, did the Lord click like? <laughs> Does the Lord like what you just posted? That's what you have to ask yourself. Not do people like this or will I be, you know, my virtue signaling be in place as I talk about this issue on my social media. And the Lord's like, man, I'm not really behind that. It's interesting how 
we need to be careful with this issue. Really, in some ways, you kind of see what Hezekiah is doing here is the oldest sin in the book, pride. Even as Satan himself was lifted up with pride, that would be his downfall. But it's almost like Hezekiah comes off a of victory with the Assyrians, and he's victorious against his sickness unto death. And now the Babylonians are like, wow, Hezekiah, you got it really dialed on. You conquered the Assyrians uh, in Jerusalem. You survived a deadly thing. Look at you. And Hezekiah says, yeah, check me out. And here's all my wealth and my spices and my gold and my silver. Huh, I'm pretty amazing. It's almost like you can see Hezekiah being lifted up with pride. A huge goof. Those who walk in pride, the Lord says through Daniel, the prophet, and through Nebuchadnezzar, who le learned it the hard way, those who walk in pride, he, God, is able to abase. Well, after Hezekiah shows all the goods to the Babylonians, it says in verse three, then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, what said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, they are come from a far country to me, unto me, even from Babylon. <clears throat> and he said, uh, then said he, what have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered and said, all that is in my house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. You know, it's interesting because um, as we look at this, they, Hezekiah didn't see any reason to sort of protect. It's like he was protecting them from the Assyrians, but he let his guard down, and so he just kind of opened everything up. And I sometimes wonder if we open ourselves up to the enemy. And the greatest way to do that is to be prideful about what we have or what we do. So he's now vulnerable because of pride. He's opened himself up, showing them the treasures. Verse five, then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. Bad news. Everything that Hezekiah just showed those Babylonians, Isaiah said, yep. Yeah. Because of what you just did, all that stuff's gonna be taken by the Babylonians. Nothing's gonna be left. Verse seven, and of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the places of the king of Babylon. Now, um, if you don't know what a eunuch is, look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> um, let's just say if you're a guy, it's the last thing you really want. <laughs> and, uh, and these guys, he's basically saying your, your sons are gonna be eunuchs, which means they're gonna be serving other nations. They're not gonna have uh, a heritage or um, uh, you know, a, a posterity. And um, you know, it's, it's just like this horrible news uh, given to Hezekiah. The sons would be eunuchs. Um, in Psalm chapter 16, verse 18, it says this. Uh, pardon me, Proverbs. <laughs> wrong, wrong book. Proverbs 16, 18. Let me read it to you. Um, you guys know this one. And um, I wanted to, to read it because um, people get this wrong. Pride goeth before what? Nope, not a fall. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Interesting about, you know, being humble is, is there's a spoil involved. And, and this is where Hezekiah, his pride ends up leaving him sort of destitute, or at least his future, his family, his heritage is gonna be wiped out. His sons are gonna be eunuchs in the place of the king of Babylon and all their stuff's gonna be taken. This is because of pride. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride gets the best of us. We all tend to do this and, and fall. You know, I was reading a story of Ronald Reagan recalling an occasion when he was the governor of California years and years ago, but he made a speech in Mexico City um, and after he'd finished speaking there in Mexico City, 
Um, he sat down to sort of an unenthusiastic applause after his speech. You know, the Mexican people there were sort of like this little splattering of, of clapping and he was a little bummed out and he just sat down. Well, the next guy got up to speak after him and spoke in Spanish, which Reagan says, I didn't really understand Spanish. So he was just speaking. But when he spoke, every sentence the guy would say, there was a roar of applause and enthusiastic. The crowd responded with joy and greatness. And this made Reagan kind of like, oh brother, who's this guy? What is he saying, you know, that they love so much? Uh, so to hide his embarrassment, he says, I started clapping before everyone else and longer than anyone else until this ambassador uh, leaned over and said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. He's interpreting your speech. <laughs> I love that. Reagan told that story because he said I, he was um, kind of caught up in this issue of pride, thinking that, well, that guy, why is he getting accolades but not me? And little, you know, actually they were clapping at his speech. That's when you know that your heart is wrong, is when you're lifted up with pride and you're worried about the other guy and you're trying to show off your stuff and trying to be applauded by men. And this is where Hezekiah falls. You know, Hezekiah was a great king, but this is where he really, you know, messes it up. But there's a final verse, and this verse brings great controversy about what it actually means. Let's check it out. We'll finish up with this tonight. Isaiah chapter 39, verse eight. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. He said, moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. <laughs> Wait a minute, did you hear what he said? That's good, thanks Isaiah, good word man. At least there's peace in my days. So here's the controversy, what was he, what was he saying? Was he saying, okay, my sons are gonna be eunuchs, um, uh, and my gold and silver in the kingdom is gonna be taken and everybody's gonna be going to captivity into Babylon because of my horrible, stupid behavior. But that's good, Lord, right on, man. At least it's not gonna happen in my lifetime. At least I'm not the one who's gonna become a eunuch. At least I'm, my sons will, tough bananas for them. But, uh, but see, that's why some people interpret this, say, man, what, what in the world is Hezekiah thinking? And so some think he's just, just being sort of a weasel saying, well, at least it's not gonna happen in my lifetime. I'm gonna die and I'll, I won't even be here when all this happens. Praise the Lord. So that's how some people interpret this. Others say, no, no, no. Hezekiah was so humbled at this point, knowing that he should have died when the Lord first said he should have died, knowing that the Lord's will was better than his own will, knowing that he should just leave it to the Lord anyway. He says, though the word of the Lord is good and I'm just gonna submit to whatever God does. Like maybe he's so mature that he's saying, even though this seems bad, it is really good. And, um, and the Lord is gracious because there's peace in my days. And so some people see it as a very mature statement to finish off this chapter that Hezekiah is saying, man, so which one is it, Brad? Is he being immature, saying, well, at least I'm not gonna be the one croaking and becoming a eunuch. It's gonna be my son's tough bananas. Or is it the one where he's just mature and saying, the Lord's will be done, and I, and I know I blew it, but I'm leaving it to the Lord. Which one is it? Don't know. And you can read commentaries that go either way on this one, and it's kind of funny. But I, I think it might have been left there, at least for us, maybe tonight, maybe the Lord's saying, either one, be careful. Because if you and I are people that say, I can't believe this is happening to me and why are you doing this, Lord? That's a wrong behavior. But to, to say what Hezekiah says here, Lord, your word is good. It's a good thing. See, some of you might not like what the word of the Lord says. Some of you might not like that the Bible says in the last days, perilous times will come and all the stuff we're seeing out there right now, the, you know, the Antifa and the hostilities and and all this anger and the COVID-19 and earthquakes in diverse places and wars and rumors of wars and all the things the Bible says, in the last days, these things shall, shall come. Some of you are like, not so, Lord. And man, we demand, Lord, I want peace in this world and, and we wanna fix this world and it's all about this world. And the Lord's saying, well, this is my word. And some of us need to say like Hezekiah, Lord, good is your word. Even though it's bad for us now, your will, your plan is good. And just to maturely submit to it. 
Others of you might say, well, at least we're not gonna have to go through the tribulation. At least we're not gonna have to, we'll be raptured. And you might be saying, hey, at least I don't have, and we don't care about people and salvation and sharing the gospel. Uh, having the wrong perspective on what the Lord's word says is gonna happen can be really dastardly and very evil. So either Hezekiah is being very mature here or he's being kind of evil. Uh, I can't tell you which one, but the question is, what are you doing right now? Are you living in these days saying, well, at least I'm saved, at least I'm going to heaven, I don't care about everybody else. Uh, at least I'm forgiven of my sins, so forget telling the gospel to other people, they're just gonna be fuel for hell, oh well. Or are you broken and saying, man, the Lord's word is true, and so I need to care about what's gonna happen and be broken before God and be busy about what the Lord told us to do. I see this sort of question mark at the end of chapter uh, 39 as sort of being something that is a good question to ask yourself. What is your attitude toward the word of God? Are you saying good is the word of the Lord? Even when it's bad, it's still good because it's God's word and it's his plan and it's his purpose. Something for us to think about, something for us to pray about. Now, this is exciting because we've reached chapter 40. And uh, in chapter 40, that's where we start to turn, um, some people call it the New Testament of Isaiah. Remember how I told you Isaiah is sort of divided into two sections. And you know, some people say, I don't like the Old Testament, blood and guts, and the New Testament is so much more fun because grace and love and kindness. Some people see that differentiation between the, between the first half of Isaiah and you know, chapters one through 39, and then chapters 40 and onward starts to change the tune to be more of a positive, uh, good message. So we're, we're getting into the dessert now of Isaiah, which is gonna be fun. And we'll be looking to that starting this weekend, so praise the Lord for that. You made it to this part, that's a, it's a landmark. This is a spot to be glad about. <laughs> uh, let's pray. And Lord, how thankful we are for your word. It's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And I pray, Lord, that you would let it do its work in our hearts and our minds, Lord, and help us to learn the lessons from Hezekiah the king. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just hear another Bible story and another guy who made mistakes, but Lord, we see our same tendencies that are so much like Hezekiah on the heels of victory being lifted up with pride and just sort of doing stupid things during those times. Lord, help us to be on our guard and recognize the spiritual warfare that's happening around us, in front of us, to us, against us. Help us to never let our guard down but put our trust in you. I pray that we'd walk with you all of our days Teach us to pray with a submitted heart, Lord. Not our will, but your will be done. That's what we need. That's what we want. Bless your people tonight. In these days of consternation and trouble and division and anger, Lord, I pray your church would be more united to, than ever. Lord, may your people be harmless as, as doves, but also wise as serpents. Lord, we need wisdom in these days. Um, I pray that the, that the leadership of churches would be on their knees before you, seeking your wisdom and your face. And I pray that the congregations of, and the people wouldn't be barking out orders, telling everybody what to do, but Lord, that we would just humbly come before you and wait upon you, and that you would guide your church, Lord, through these days. I pray your blessing on these folks who've taken time on a Wednesday night to study the scriptures. Lord, may it bring forth good fruit in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you would, sing along with me on this. I don't want to sing a solo there in your house, so you got to sing with me, okay? It goes like this. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Blessings and we'll see you this weekend. God bless.